We come now to the moral attributes of God. We've been looking at the metaphysical metaphysical attributes, and now we come to the moral attributes. We, we divide the study of God's attributes into two divisions, moral and metaphysical, <laughs> metaphysical and moral. By moral attributes, we mean, of course, holiness and righteousness, things of this nature, long-suffering. Now, metaphysical, I don't know uh, how much of, how many of you know the meaning of that term. Uh, you can use any term you want. We just kind of have to divide the attributes up into two, two classifications because they really fall under two heads. If you've got another term for those we've already studied, well, that's all right. Metaphysical in philosophy and theology has to do with the existence of something. Remember, we studied, first of all, the existence of God, his nature, his being. Uh, and metaphysical attributes have to do with things God can't transfer to people, like his eternalness, his uh, omniscience, his omnipotence. Those are things he has. Moral attributes are things you can find in man, like love and so on. All right, let's come to the first uh, moral attribute, and that is God's holiness. God, in Scripture, God is said to be holy. And the two most frequently mentioned moral attributes are God's holiness and God's love. We'll be dealing, of course, with his love later. And uh, we'll give you a definition, as we do in all of these studies. Uh, the definition of God's holiness is that perfection whereby God is by nature morally separate and unique from all other creatures or from all creatures or from everything else. God's holiness is that perfection whereby God is by nature morally separate and unique from all other creatures. Now, since this is a school, we have to give you terms uh, occasionally. We avoid, uh, for those who don't study the Greek or Hebrew, uh, making it too academic, but there's some things you have to have because all the other courses like Old Testament theology and so on have to do with knowing the meanings of terms. So there are certain terms used of God's holiness. Uh, I'll transliterate it for those who don't write Hebrew. The first one is Q-A-D-A-S-H. Kadash. Kadosh. And Kodesh. Kadash is the verb, and it means to be set apart or consecrated. Be set apart or consecrated. Kadosh is the adjective which means set apart. And Kodesh is the noun which means uh, apartness or separateness. Now you notice in no cases did I say it means to be holy because that isn't what it means. Even though it's translated in Old and New Testament to be holy. Then the Greek is hagiazo. Hagiazo, or H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. O. Hagiazo. Now, you have to get the Greek and Hebrew terms in a lot of things. Are you? There was no point in studying these things. We just become parrots of the commentaries and the versions. And, in, and this Greek word means to be set apart or to consecrate. Again, you notice there's no uh, mention of holiness. 
And yet, that's the way the words are always, without exception, translated in the Bible, to be holy. Well, what does it mean to be holy? And there we're faced again with the problem, aren't we? Someone says, uh, God requires you to be holy, and so he says, well, or she, that's fine. What am I supposed to do or be? What would you tell them? So you think you know a lot about the Bible and you find out you don't unless you know the languages and unless you have somebody that teaches you what the meanings are if you don't know the languages. Because a, a translation is an interpretation. It is never, there is no way in the world to translate fully what is written in the original Hebrew and Greek uh, to everyone's satisfaction. Now, that has to be taken in the context in which I'm talking you can get saved out of any version I know of. We're not talking about getting saved. We're talking about studying to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we're talking about. Students of the word. That's what God has called everybody to be. It is a pain in the neck to some people, a headache to others, but for those who want to go deeper with God, it's a blessing uh, to discipline themselves into some deeper study. Now, once you know the basic meaning, then you can get a derived meaning, like holy out of it. And so any of these words can mean holy as a derived mean, meaning. So you want, you want to put down after that, that uh, first one, you could put in parenthesis to be holy. And the second one, uh, kadosh, you could put holy, and, but put it in parenthesis because the word doesn't mean that. Second one is holy. Third one could be holiness, kodesh. And uh, the Greek hagiazo sometimes is translated to be to sanctify. And you could put uh, to sanctify and to be holy in parentheses. So we have to start with meanings, basic meanings, and then we can understand what derived meanings are. Now, many words in Greek and Hebrew have derived meanings because of association with God or with Christianity or so forth. Um, the word saint is derived from these terms, like kadosh can be translated to saint. But then if somebody says, what's a saint? You've got to explain that, don't you? So the term kadosh, holy, that's the basic term, kadosh, holy can refer to anything that's set apart. Anything that's set apart. And uh, we won't get into all of the ways it can be used. That's for Old Testament theology, since it's a Hebrew term. But uh, it's even used of the temple prostitutes in the false or pagan religions. So it certainly doesn't mean to be holy. The word in itself doesn't mean to be holy. It means what I told you. It means to be set apart for something. In that case, they're set apart for prostitution. That's all the word means. So it has a derived meaning. What does holy mean, kadosh mean, with respect to its basic meaning? When we use it uh, with reference to God, for example, what, what does kadosh mean with respect to its basic meaning of apartness or separateness? Now, you're supposed to write questions like that in case you don't know it, because... See, that will explain then what I tell you. I'm always amazed people sit and watch me when I'm giving them what I'm, I'm, I've repeated three or four times. That means write it, dear friend. I can say it once, but I don't want you to remember it. So in what sense is God holy with regard to kadosh, with respect to its basic meaning of apartness or emptiness? See, if you didn't write that, you wouldn't know then what I told you when you read your notes back. It wouldn't make, it wouldn't make sense to you. All right, we're asking the question, what does holy mean with regard to God? Since holy, it really means, not holy, but to be set apart. Partness, separateness. So with respect to God, it's his moral uniqueness. Remember, it's something set apart now. Keep that in mind. Not something that's pure as far as the word itself has meaning. 
It is his moral uniqueness. It is, secondly, it's his moral transcendence. We had defined transcendence once before. It's his absolute purity. Well, what we're saying is that holiness derives its meaning of sinlessness and moral and ethical purity because it's associated with God. See, in itself, uh, Kedeshah is a prostitute. And that's the very word we've got here. Kadosh, put a feminine ending on it, you got Kedeshah. And so uh, the word has meaning with reference to what are you set apart to. In the case of a temple prostitute, she was set apart to unholiness. And so how can we uh, talk about uh, the the terms meaning holy in the Old and New Testament is because they're in reference to God. With regard to, the word means to be set apart, it means to be separate from something. So in God's case, it's separate from sin and sinners and all the defiles. It has reference to his moral separateness his moral and spiritual and ethical otherness, his absolute purity. Because God is pure and holy, then to be set apart to him means that we partake of whatever he is in that sense. But keep in mind, the word doesn't mean to be holy or to sanctify. You see, you get in trouble in John 17 where Jesus said, I sanctify myself. And that's that Greek word, to be set apart. How could he sanctify himself. That isn't what he said. That means to make holy, to make pure. He's already pure. He praised the Father. He said, I set myself apart. I consecrate myself. That's what the word means. And it's translated to sanctify, which leaves the wrong impression. Like he had to be made holy. So he is holy in the sense of moral purity. Therefore, these words because we're set apart unto God, have have a derived meaning of, ho- of purity. You see, moral that's what you mean by holiness, moral purity. So we asked quite a while ago, if someone asked you, well, what does it mean to be holy? If most people couldn't give an answer. You'd search around for an hour to think of moral purity if you ever thought of it. But that's what you mean by it. You knew that's what you meant when you heard it, when we defined it for you. But that isn't what the word means. It means that because... Our separation is unto God, who is morally pure. And then, without using the words, we get this teaching about God all through Scripture. Like in Habakkuk 1.13, He is of pure eyes than to behold evil. See, God's holiness means that He can't even look at evil. He is of pure eyes than to behold evil. Job 25.5, the stars are not pure in his sight. See, this is the kind of God that when they say God is holy, you don't mean he's set apart to something. It means that he is separate from everything that man or the created order is. Psalm 113.5 and 6 speak of this otherness. We're talking about his separateness, his otherness. We're not... uh, talking now about the meaning of the word. Psalm 113, 5 and 6. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who must humble himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? God has to humble himself even to look at the things in heaven. Now that is absolutely true. That Those are not just figures of speech. God has to humble himself to look at anything else except himself. He is absolutely other than what we are, what the created order is. He is totally pure, righteous, holy. God, you see, God can, uh, God has to love himself because he's the perfect object of love. So he loves himself in the Son. Father loves Son, Son loves Father in the communion of the Holy Spirit, you see. That's why the Trinity is triune nature of God, as Calvin said, is essential. 
or was it Augustine? Doesn't matter, one of the two said it. That the Augustine said it. That the Trinity argues for itself that the Father must express his love toward something. And so it's toward the Son, and the Son toward the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. So holiness with respect to God means his total separation from sin and evil. When we say God, use kadosh with respect to God, it means his total separation from sin and evil. Uh, you see, you have to define holiness. Holiness doesn't tell you a thing, like propitiation doesn't tell you anything. Atonement. Explain the word atonement. We, there's so many theological terms translated in the Bible. If they would just use the literal meaning, <clears throat> it would help us so much. See, the word atonement doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible. That's a made-up word. Now, I'm not implying that it's in the same category as Jehovah, that made-up name of God, but the word atonement doesn't, doesn't occur. It has come to be accepted to mean, have reference to Christ's work on the cross. But the Hebrew and Greek terms are much more graphic. The Hebrew wor word translated all through the Old Testament atonement means to cover over. God covers over sin with the blood of the Lamb, you see. And that's translated by a word that no one really knows the meaning to. No one knows the meaning of atonement. As we, we know what it's supposed to mean, but no one can explain where it came from. Yes. Um, when using the word um, kadosh in, um, in, okay, in, the, trans, in the translation, mm -hmm. is there another word that they would put with it that would make it, would make it seem um, se you know, separate from... Uh, separate from um, all unrighteousness and purity? <coughs> Not always. You see, this is why you study theology. is because you have to study the whole of Revelation to see how words and terms are used. You, get, you don't get all the basic meaning out of knowing Hebrew or Greek because, as you've already discovered, since you study Hebrew, you may have six possibilities on a word, and sometimes you've got 60. Generally, though, you don't have a problem. You know just what it means, and you pick it right out of the dictionary and put it in your translation of the Hebrew verse. So you need more than the bare language. And we have to see how God and the prophets and the apostles use the terms, what context and all. Often this helps determine the meaning. So uh, uh, there's not necessarily a word always occurring with kadosh, holy, which means apartness and separateness. But uh, as you see how it's used, you see this idea that whenever the terms are used, it means to be set apart unto God's use. Since he is holy, pure, uh, and righteous, then this is why when we are called holy, use that term used of us, we don't translate it uh, consecrated, we translate it holy because now we, we have come to accept the meaning as moral purity. But it's because of its usage, you see, not the meaning of the term. And there are a number of words like that. So I say atonement does not occur at all in the Bible. The word, and that's, that's the basic word in Christianity. And we know, we think we know what we mean by it, but we don't know what the word means or where it came from. So it's better to study God's word and not translations, if we can help it, and come to, to see what God really said. And when he said, this will be an atonement for your sins when you offer the blood on the altar, he didn't say that. This will be a covering for your sins. That makes more sense to me because I don't know what atonement means. I know because I'm a Christian and it's always related to the de Christ's death on the cross. But I couldn't tell a pagan atonement. But if I use his word for covering over his sins, he'd know what that meant. And that's what the Hebrew says. And just many, many words are that way. So I say you can get saved out of any translation, but we're not talking to uh, unregenerate people or people we're trying to get saved. We're taking people on into the, to the Word. All right. Holiness, in the sense now we, we've derived the meaning from it because of its association with a pure, 
sinless God, we said holiness with respect to God means his total separation from sin and evil, then holiness becomes a synonym for God's name in the Bible. Isaiah 57, 15, God whose name is holy. Isaiah 57, 15. Holiness is so much to be identified with God now that we know what it means, moral purity, sinlessness, in its derived sense, then it comes to be God's name. See, the Israelites knew what the word meant. It meant to be set apart. But they knew God was of pure eyes and to behold evil, that he was perfectly righteous without sin. Therefore, whenever you talked about God being holy, you, they knew that meant to be completely the opposite of whatever sin or evil is. And so it derives a meaning of purity, you see. Isaiah 1.4, over and over, Isaiah uses this term, for the name of God, instead of saying Yahweh, he says the Holy One of Israel. See, it becomes a name for God. Then thirdly, Isaiah 6, 3, where Isaiah, where the, the seraphim don't cry Yahweh, 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 or Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They say Holy, 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 because that means the same thing. Of course, that would be a little early to use Jesus, I recognize. I was trying to make a point. But they could have said, Yavi, Yavi, Yavi. But in Isaiah, they, they cry, and they continually cry before the throne, God's synonym for God's name, Holy, Holy, Holy. They know they're not talking about the saints or his throne or anything else. They're talking about him. They're talking about God. And all through Isaiah, he's called the Holy One of Israel. Now, the Roman Catholics call the Pope His Holiness, but the Bible reserves that title for God. I'll tell you one thing. A man's going to have to answer for allowing anyone to call him His Holiness. You can mark that down somewhere in the margin. If he were free from any other guilt, he'd have to answer for that one, because only God can be called His Holiness. And... Catholics are inexcusable for calling a mere man his holiness. In fact, don't any of you reverends let anybody consistently call you reverend. Or don't call yourself reverend. It's hard to get away from others doing it because you walk down the street, hello reverend, you know. But uh, uh, only of God is that title used. Holy and reverend is his name. It's never used of man. Now, God's holiness is the motivation for his expression against all wrath and sin. That's why he punishes sin, because he's holy. That's the motivation. Now, what I'm saying is very, very significant, because people don't really have a consciousness of God's holiness or of sin. But because God treats his holiness seriously, he treats sin seriously. God takes his holiness seriously. I didn't give one. What did I say? I don't know. What I, I was just talking. Oh, the, God's holiness is the motivation for his judgment against sin. That's what motivates him to punish sinners. That's what we're saying. See, God takes his holiness seriously, therefore he takes sin seriously. Conversely, when we lose a sense of God's holiness, as the church has done, men don't take sin seriously. They don't see the depth of sin. You see, it's God's holiness that reveals the depth, depth of sin. Sin can exist in God's universe as if it didn't matter. And because God is seriously concerned with his holiness... Man cannot ever, in the least sense, violate his holy order and be guiltless. Holiness is the thing God requires of everything in his universe. No man will ever sin with impunity. He may try to rationalize his sin, but he will answer to God. It could not be any more plainly stated than in Hebrews 
follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. God takes sin seriously. Follow peace with all and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 1 Peter 15, 1, 15 to 17 Be ye holy as I am holy. Ezekiel 36 shows God's concern for his holiness. God is deeply concerned for his holiness. If you haven't ever grasped just an insignificant part of what God's holiness means, you'll see why that he could offer, do nothing less than send the best for man's forgiveness, his son Jesus Christ, because he is so pure that even for the wind to blow contrary in God's universe is an impossible conception in God's mind. I guess you know the devil's behind the contrary winds. Jesus always rebuked them. He didn't say, what a beautiful demonstration of God's power. But if we ever get the least ray of understanding of God's holiness, you'll see why sin is so terrible. It is impossible for God even to look upon sin. Therefore, he takes his holiness seriously, as we see here in Ezekiel 36. Begin reading at verse 16. This is just one of many, many, many. In fact, all through the Bible, he shows his concern for his holiness. That's the motivation for everything he does with respect to man. It's to make him holy and to punish all unholiness. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, and note the emphasis upon his holiness. When the house of Israel dwelt in her own land, they're in captivity, by the way. Ezekiel is a prophet of the captivity in Babylon. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their own doings. Now that's unholiness, you see, defiling. Their way was before me as uncleanness of a removed woman. That means a woman in her period. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. You see where his concern is. They profaned my holy name when they said to them, these are the people of the Lord. You know, they were such sinners, he said, they profaned my holy name just to say they belong to me. So it's a sin in God's sight, to call yourself a Christian if you're not living like one. See, you profane his name. So these, they said, they profane my name, my holy name, when they said they're the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of, this, out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name. He didn't say he had pity on them. I had pity for my holy name when the house of Israel had profaned, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, this is what Ezekiel is to prophesy to them in captivity, Thus saith the Lord God, I do this not for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, whither you went. And I will separate, or sanctify, it's all right in this case, my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the God, saith God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you and a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Notice where it's going, within. The Old Testament was without. And I'll cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll keep my judgments and do them. But the significant thing is, 
Verse 22, he's not going to do this for their sake, but he said, for my holy name's sake, I'm going to deliver you out of Babylon. And one day, of course, he's going to do away with the law and write it on their hearts. Give them a new heart. God's holiness. Now, we deal with that in Old Testament theology, so uh, without too much repetition, I don't want to say any more. If you have any questions, we'll take them. And if not, we're going to move on to another moral attribute. Understand, basically, that holiness means, or rather, well, the terms translated to sanctify are to be holy, holy or holiness or sanctification are not the literal meaning of the words, meanings of the words, but uh, these are derived meanings. You have to know what you mean by sanctify and holiness. Are those, are you no better off? than not having studied the Bible. You're just at the mercy of the commentaries and the translations. And you can't help people if they ever ask you a question. I still uh, challenge anybody to define faith to a person when they ask you, what do you mean to have faith or to believe? What are you going to tell them? Well, I expect you would know, yes, because we constantly teach faith. What's it mean to have faith? What is faith? It's good to know where Hebrews 11 1 is. Well, uh, who's got to buy a Hebrew Bible? Yes, it would be, uh, it'd be the adjective, yeah. Six oh eight. Well, uh, since you volunteer that, I'll look for six oh eight. But I could have found it the other way. <laughs> so all right, as long as you're using the same versions, you can always say the page number. Well, what verse would it be about three? It wouldn't be 608, would it? Yeah, 609. No, 6. Chapter 6 is what we want. I'm in chapter 1. Chapter 6. Yeah. Kadosh. And this one cried to that one, and he said, Kadosh, 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 Yahweh Savaot. And this one said to that one, Holy, 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 Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of hosts. Filled, filled all the earth. Fill all the earth with his glory. He fills all the earth with his glory. That's what the Hebrew said. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Well, I knew it did without looking it up. It'd have to be. Anyone have any questions on what we've already... All right. Be ye holy as I am holy. Uh, you see, that's what we said. To be consecrated unto God is to be consecrated unto his moral purity and righteousness. See, to say, for God to say, be holy as I am holy, you have to say, well, what am I supposed to be or do? But even in subconsciously, you kind of know that means to be pure, doesn't it? Sinless. So, see, we've kind of got the derived meaning in our mind on some of these words, and that's all right. Uh, like atonement, even though you couldn't really explain it, you know that refers to Christ's death on the cross for our sins. And so, um, when God says, be you holy as I am holy, we take the moral derived sense of that word, and that means to be pure. 
But what he said is to be to be consecrated as I am. And what consecrated unto what? To righteousness, holiness, purity, love, everything God is. It's not just being pure. Uh, in respect to the different verses like uh, be angry and, and uh, uh, put the words down your wrath uh, and uh, this song says to hate evil. Uh, could you expound on that part of our calling to be holy? And it says, what does the verse say? Be angry. Be angry and sin not. Well, of course, this doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but. Uh, I just want to say the <clears throat> Did he? What did he say? I mean, I can get... See, the the thing is, with that verse not having to do with this, there's no consensus of opinion on what Paul meant there. It's just one of those verses, what, what was he saying? Which, uh, if we get into that, then we'll get too far afield. I'm not trying to put it aside, because... Um, you have to first get into the Greek, what does the word mean? Does it mean to be angry? Does it mean to be agitated with yourself and control your temper? You know, get not angry with yourself. So obviously, where we're told not to get angry, it can't mean be angry and sin not. That's a contradiction. It's just a bad translation. So again, you have to get into the Greek, what's the word mean, and uh, so on. Okay, righteous. Let's come to another moral attribute of God. Righteous. The terms. See, if I give them to you now, I won't have to give them to you later in another subject. Sadiq means to be righteous or just. That's, uh, I want to study. Sadiq means righteousness or justice. Dikaios for the Greek. Some of you had a little Greek, so write the Greek first. Dikaios sune means, Dikaios means righteous or just in the New Testament. Dikaios sune means righteousness, justice. That's T S D. I Q. That's D D. Two Ds. C T S. Well, let's start over. Okay, scratch that one. T S A D D I Q. Sadik. This one is Sadik. And this Greek, you can figure out Greek almost. It's just about like English. D-I-K-A-I-O-S. Dikaios. D-I-K. Greek's a lot easier to read than Hebrew. O. S U M E. Long E. Dikaios Sune. Now, if you notice, I gave you two terms for both of those. Righteous. Righteous and just, righteousness and justice. The words mean both those things. God's justice is the other side of his righteousness. Same terms used mean the same thing. Now the original meaning of the Hebrew is to be straight. To be straight or firm. I won't do so much writing. That puts out too much heat. To be straight or firm. See, again, if someone says, what do you mean to be righteous? you got a problem explaining it. So the meaning doesn't mean basically to be righteous. It means to be straight, firm, level, you know, firm. And in the moral and religious sense, it means, therefore, to be right. You know, straight or right. To conform to the proper standard or norm. In the moral or religious sense, 
spiritual sense, means to conform to the proper standard or norm. Now, here's what the word means, you see. We deal with meanings, and then we get drive. Man built a wall, and it leaned over like that much. In fact, they always lean some, so he puts a plumb line on it, string with a weight on it. And then he brings the wall into conformity to that, and then it conforms to the proper standard norm. That's what to be righteous means. It means you conform to a straight line. Something straight or right. Or if you were in the business of making triangles, if that's what you sold, some of your workers turned out some look like that or that or even like that. It wouldn't be conforming to the standard or norm, so it would be unrighteous. That's what the words mean. It has to conform to the standard or norm. Now you know what it means to be righteous. It doesn't mean to be something that I can't explain. It means I have to line up with whatever God says is the straight line. And what is that? His word, the holy law, Jesus Christ. Are the, the These things are the standards or the norms. Uh, God speaks in Isaiah 28:17, saying, Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. Judgment I will lay to the line. In other words, his judgment will conform to an exact standard. And righteousness he will lay, he will check with the plummet, you see. This plummet hanging here. It always hangs straight. And so, Righteousness is conforming to God's standard. What is his standard? It's the holy law. The standard of righteousness is God's holy law, first of all. It's three, two or three things. Let's start with that. To be righteous means you conform to God's moral law, his holy law. That is very clearly set forth uh, all through the Bible. God will never ever change the demands that are in his law upon man. He will judge him according to the law. Whether or not he adhered to it or not. Uh, when we say the law is done away with, we mean the dispensation. But it's, it remains, and the Bible is clear on that, God's standard of righteousness. You mean under grace, now it's all right to kill, or to worship idols, or to covet your neighbor's wife or property? No, the Ten Commandments, as we call the moral law, uh, these have never been done away with as far as their righteousness. Now that's easily proven from the Bible. You're never, you were never saved by keeping the law, but it was God's standard to measure whether or not you were righteous or not. Did you keep it? Righteous. If you didn't, you were unrighteous. Well, no one ever kept it. So then he, of course, had the system of sacrifice to make up the difference. Romans 8 clearly shows you that the law has never, the standard, the moral righteousness of the law has never, uh, could never be done away with. It's eternal. That's a revelation of what God demands to be right and to be holy with it. All right, Romans 8. Therefore is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now what is, what is conformed in us? What is fulfilled in us? The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now we're way over in the book of Romans, dear soul. And you've been taught, you know, everything's done away with in the Old Testament. You have to understand what we, it means that we're not under law. 
the righteousness of the law has not the fulfilling, the necessity to fulfill the righteousness of the law in us has nothing to do with the fact that we're not under law dispensation. Law never did save, didn't save the Jew. It was God's standard to show him he needed sacrifice for forgiveness. It was to show him he could not be righteous by trying to keep God's eternal standard. Therefore, he brought us to the dispensation of grace and faith. But it is the righteousness of the law that's fulfilled in us. Always keep that in mind. Now, there are a lot of scriptures that say that. We uh, don't have time to try to prove that one point. We have in other messages, other tapes, other teachings. Now, how is it fulfilled in us since we can't keep it? Since it has to be fulfilled in us by faith. That's Romans 3, 20, 22. Romans 3, 20, 22. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So you can see that by the deeds of the law, no one was ever saved, or could be. No one. And remember, we gave you two meanings for the word sedek and sedekah and uh, sadik and all these other words. There were two meanings, righteousness and justice. <laughs> are to be righteous, are to be just, are justified. So this is what we're looking at. What he said in verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be made righteous in his sight. See, that's saying the same thing because the word means to be righteous or just. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, that's all law does, reveal to you you're a sinner. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference. So the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us by faith. So we're talking about righteousness meaning conformity to God's norm or standard. What is it? First of all, it's his holy law. Now, if you read all of Romans, you'll see the law is holy and good. Nothing the matter with the law. Romans 7, he says the law is holy, the law is good. The problem is I can't keep it, is Paul's confession. See, there's nothing wrong with the law. Don't ever get a wrong view of the law. It was adequate for the dispensation it was intended to serve. And the uh, moral principles of the law, I can find I can find every commandment taught in the New Testament. But you were never saved by keeping law, and so what God removed was law dispensation, not law, law dispensation. You see, we still have to meet the demands of the law, but we do it by faith in the one who did it perfectly and in his atoning work. Romans 8, remember? And Romans 3 said you keep it by faith. So that's the first uh, standard that we must meet. The second is, of course, Jesus Christ and the Scriptures. God's righteousness, uh, the standard of God's righteousness is revealed in his word and perfectly in Jesus Christ. And Jesus always pointed to himself, to no one or, no, no one or nothing outside himself. He said, as I am, be like me. And again... We fulfill all of these requirements by faith. Now, faith isn't just saying, well, I take it by faith, but faith is walking it out by faith. <laughs> Again, uh, you can teach for months and years, and people still don't understand what faith means in a practical application. They know what it means to claim the money they need or to be healed, but you don't claim you're righteous by faith. And, and stop there. But it's it's a walk. It's something you do. Let me show you righteousness, not merely one's belief or character, something he does. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it as it is at this day, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he's commanded them. So righteousness is doing something. 
It's not merely one's faith, one's character, but it is translated into deeds. Faith that has not works is dead. Righteousness that has not works is dead. That's what he's saying. Amos 5.24, let your righteousness run down as streams of water. You see, it's doing something. Amos 5.24, then Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 13, verse 12. First of all, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. He's talking about doing or not doing something. Unrighteousness is doing sin. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. See, it's doing something, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you've yielded your members' servants to unrighteousness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even now yield your members, means your body, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. So righteousness is doing as well as an experience expression of faith or one's character. One is not righteous who doesn't practice righteousness. 1 John 2.29 No one is righteous who says I'm righteous and that's all there is to it any more than he has faith because he says he has it. It's always proved by one's deeds. First John 2.29 If you know that he is righteous, Jesus, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So there we're plainly told you do righteousness. Everyone that doeth righteousness. He didn't say everyone who's righteous is born of him, but everyone who does righteousness. First John 2.29 Chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. And there you have it. 1 John 3, 7. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. You have to do it to be righteous. Verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not from God. So righteousness, in the biblical sense, is conformity to a standard and norm, but it isn't saying, by faith, I conform to it. It's, it's doing it. Of course, you do, by faith. But the doing is by faith. Now the Hebrew, ter- Hebrew and Greek terms for righteousness, I say, also mean justice. So we'll look before we close briefly at those, uh, the other side of righteousness. Righteousness and justice are the same words in Greek and Hebrew. We said God's righteousness is his own conformity to his holy sinless nature. God's righteousness is his conformity to his own holy, sinless nature. We get the meaning of righteousness because God is righteous. He conforms, his righteousness is conforming to some standard. So God can conform to no standard outside himself. So he conforms perfectly to himself. He demands that conformity from his creatures through the law which we keep by faith as is revealed in the Holy Law, as is revealed in His Word, as is revealed in Jesus Christ. All right. Now, God's justice, then, is His absolute fairness in His treatment of His creatures with respect to their conformity or nonconformity to this norm or standard. God's justice is his absolute fairness in his treatment of us 
with regard to whether or not we conform to his standard. Over and over, just and righteous is he. That's what is said of God. Just and righteous. Not just righteous, but he's just. He will never, he will never judge or punish or chasten or bless except in perfect righteousness. God is righteous, so he demands perfect righteousness from us. He's also just, so he visits all conformity to his righteousness with blessing and all nonconformity with punishment. Someone have a question? His justice is his absolute fairness toward his creatures with respect to their conformity or nonconformity to his his uh, standard that he set up, standard or norm. He is perfectly just in his righteousness. So you can't separate God's justice from his righteousness, or nor ours. That's why they're the same word. You see this, for example, worked out in Genesis 18. To give an example of how his righteousness and justice go together. They're really... Two sides of the same thing. This is in uh, God getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham stands before him and prays on behalf of them. Genesis 18:23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And so he's, we know the rest of the story. He's telling him there that the truth that God will do right, the judge of all the earth will do right. Romans chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 sets forth this truth. Paul says, speaking to the Jew, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after that thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his works. He speaks here of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his works. God is righteous, but he's also just and he will judge us according to our works, is what we're told here. Praise the Lord. So justice is the other side of his righteousness. He demands righteousness and he visits our conformity to his standard, his word, his blessing, and visits nonconformity with chastisement or judgment, depending on circumstances.